there's an unconscious brilliance actually to yeah. what they do. He wasn't able to hear other people because he saw himself as being more intelligent, uh, more plugged into the truth than other people. Uh, he was aggressive. He was a verbally abusive. Um, he could not escape the uh, unconscious forces that were driving that kind of behavior. Mm, right. And the moment, the moment that character starts lagging behind the success, then you've, you've got a significant problem. for joining us and downloading Confessions of a Worship Leader. My name is Brandon Dempsey of worshipteamtraining.com and the author of this podcast site and coming book. If you are or were in a place where you've been burned, damaged, or discouraged by ministry, then this podcast and site is just for you. Uh, these are my stories and those that we have on this show, just like our good friend here, Ian Cron, uh, guests that share about their crazy and heartbreaking church ministry experiences and to put them out for you and other candidate topics to help you in your walk as a worship or ministry leader. Today's confession, help my pastor turn into Mr. Hyde. Special guest today, Ian Morgan Cron. So let's jump into this topic before we introduce our special guests, just to kind of whet your appetite of what we're talking about. Is your pastor a Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde, or are they both? Uh, there is a reason why behaviors matter and what may seem a series of impulsivity, micromanaging, gaslighting, and narcissism are a real telltale sign of the real person that you're working with or serving with. So let's pull back the curtain with Ian Morgan Cron as we learn about why behaviors matter and how to handle the damage that they cause. So let's talk about our good friend, Ian Morgan Cron, who's sitting here in the hot seat. He is a champion of the Enne Enneagram Awakener of People, sought after speaker with LeaderCast, Catalyst, the Michael Hyatt Company, Discovery Channel, and Edge Mentoring, of whom he had done a lot of occasions of speaking for. He's also the creator and the host of the show, Typology, a podcast that explores the mystery of the human personality and how we can use the Enneagram typing system as a tool to become our most authentic selves. Ian is also a best-selling author of books, Chasing Francis, A Pilgrim's Tale, Memoir, Jesus, My Father, The CIA, and Me, my personal favorite. And Ian is a Episcopal priest and trained psychotherapist. He and his wife, Anne, live in Nashville, Tennessee. And you want to check out Ian's new popular book on Enneagram called The Road Back to You. So you don't want to miss it. Without further ado, let's welcome Ian Morgan Cron. Ian, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Hey, it's great to have you. And uh, thank you for being a guest here. And it's been a while since we hung out. But man, I've been eager to get you on this topic to have your thoughts and just to share what you've learned and what you know about it. So let's jump right in. Let's confess the mess to help my pastor turn into Mr. Hyde. So, Ian, um, what is behavior? And how can we understand it? Uh, what are the effects on other people, in particular staff and pastors, uh, especially when behaviors are abused? Hmm. Well, uh, it's a very big question. What is behavior, right? Uh, in part, because there, there are multiple schools, many schools of psychology, all of which might have a different explanation uh, for or description of what behavior is and what its source is. Um, I would say that um, behavior might be defined <laughs> as predictable, habitual patterns of acting, thinking, and feeling that um, we see demonstrated in an individual over an enduring period of time, right? So we see a pattern uh, that isn't just momentary, but, you know, over years, um, uh, a pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting that uh, becomes characteristic of that person's interpersonal 
um, way of being in the world. Now, that could be from a cognitive behavioral uh, approach where, you know, uh, thoughts create feelings that cr- create behaviors that create thoughts that create feelings that create, you know what I mean? Then right. you get into cycles of, of behavior. Um, behavior is, you know, also uh, profoundly affected by culture, uh, profoundly affected by our spiritual uh, culture and uh, influences. Um, and let's not forget genetics. Uh, temperament, disposition. So again, it's a very big question as to what is behavior. uh, And, um, but I think that'll suffice for now. So how is behavior or when does it become abusive? Mm. Well, I think it's when uh, we begin to violate uh, and tread on people's boundaries, mm-hmm. right? Um, when um, we uh, begin to uh, experience uh, another human being's uh, behavior as intrusive, as invasive, um, without disregard for our feelings and our thoughts uh, and our life patterns. Um, and that looks different for different people. Um, the kind of um, you know, for example, I know people who are very, very aggressive, and um, some people might experience that person as abusive, and other people may be like, best leader I've ever worked with. You, mm. you know what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah. like there's no sort yeah. of standard response. You know, if, you, if you've read the, um, the, the biography of uh, Steve Jobs, right? Well, a lot of people experience Steve Jobs as an abusive bully, right? I mean, just you know, pathological uh, kind of a bully with very little regard for other people's feelings and thoughts. On the other hand, there were people in his inner circle to, to whom to this day say that he was the most brilliant, pioneering, you know, uh, inspiring person they ever worked with. So again, you know, uh, abuse is in many ways self-defined. Um, what might feel like, okay, to me, feels bad to you. Um, so now when you begin to see, um, a large segment of a particular population experiencing a person as abusive, well, then you really got to take notice, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, again, I think it's very, very subjective. Um, and, um, you know, certain personality types can endure another person better than others. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Everyone has their own interpretation to different personalities. And uh, one may find a person that could just be maybe overly direct, but no sweat to the ego. Uh, others may find that, in fact, a little bit more over demanding. So um, what is that like then when you involve yourself into a staff situation and you, you meet the pastor before you take the job? He's right. the Dr. Jekyll, right? And everything seems fine at first. Uh, but behavior-wise, once you step into that vocation, he becomes the Mr. Hyde. And this is not the nice Mr. Hyde, and Mr. Hyde is not nice anyway. Uh, but how does one uh, cope with that? How does one survive on staff with that kind of behavior within a pastor? Right. So let me just back up a little bit and talk about narcissism. Okay. Um, what you're describing right there is kind of classic, the classic experience of a narcissist. Um, when you meet a narcissist in the beginning, almost from the get go, they are incredibly charming. Um, they are inspiring. Um, they will make you feel like you are the most awesome human being they have ever hired. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. They will love on you in the beginning. Um, they will, uh, you know, flatter you. Um, they will, uh, you know, kind of in a way, embar- in sometimes in an embarrassing way, overvalue your, you know, your presence on, on the team. Now, that lasts for a bit of a season. Okay. Mm-hmm. But once you're into the web, like once you're caught in the web, you begin to see uh, a disintegration of that pattern, right? 
And here's what you're going to notice about that individual. One, of, one thing is uh, uh, a pattern of grandiosity, okay? Uh, you're going to see uh, a person that uh, has an excessive need for admiration, okay? Um, uh, there's a kind of a, a, a real fantasy world for this person in which they have uh, unlimited power, right? Uh, and that they're brilliant. Um, uh, they will, uh, they have a sense of entitlement. Um, they uh, can be, ex this is a big one. They, they can be exploitative mm. uh, of, of other people. Um, here's a key one. They lack, <clears throat> they lack empathy. And that's a, that's a very big uh, hallmark feature of, of narcissists. Um, you know, empathy meaning, um, you know, they'll call you at two in the morning with, a, with an idea. Yeah. It's like, dude, it's two in the morning. Right. right. That's in, that's entitlement. Uh, that's lacking empathy for your rest. Right. Um, they may uh, require that you work 60 hours a week, though you have five kids. You know what I mean? This mm -hmm. is ex that's exploitative. That is uh, lacking empathy um, and lacking empathy for your feelings, um, uh, for, you know, treading over boundaries, as I mentioned earlier. And just there's kind of an arrogance and uh, sometimes a passive aggressive or explicitly aggressive pattern of behavior. Um, now, the reason I started off with sort of describing a narcissistic person, that may not be a full-blown narcissistic personality disorder, or it might be, right? Now, the reason I say that is I see this a lot with uh, successful pastors. Um, they, in the beginning, are incredibly charming. They can recruit staff and church members like nobody's business. They're a magnet mm. for those folks. Now, the more successful a church becomes or a spiritual organization becomes, the more entitled, the more that narcissistic behavior begins to flower, mm. right? Um, and I could name tons of pastors, right, that we know, famous pastors who have fallen from the heights because um, their, you know, narcissistic behavior began to become bordering, if not becoming pathological, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and then eventually it falls. Now, one of the things, I hope I'm not going too long here, no. but one of the things that will happen is they will surround themselves with uh, lay leaders and other people who uh, are easily manipulated and also that are afraid and intimidated by them. And as you mentioned, the word gaslighting, that can keep people in the game a long time. You know what I mean? Like you could right. serve, you go for years thinking, is this me or him or right. her? You know right. what I mean? It's like, huh, I don't know. He said this on Wednesday. Now he's saying something different on Saturday and telling me I'm stupid when I can remember him saying that on Tuesday, you know? Right. And, you know, I say all this because, you know, I've been brought into situations as an Enneagram teacher and a psychotherapist, you know, and I think to myself, man, I could have helped you five years ago. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, kinda, I <laughs> yeah. probably could have helped this thing not happen Yeah. Um, if this person was open because mm. when you accrue a lot of success, um, you know, you can justify that behavior. You can say, okay, so I can be a bit of a jerk, but you know, we have 5,000 people now. Sure. And then, you know, anyway, long answer to your question, but I hope a little educational. No, I love that. So, it, and it sounds like, you know, we talk a lot about spiritual abuse here on Confessions of a Worship Leader. Um, and many don't even realize, uh, myself included, when I first began a ministry, didn't have any idea what spiritual abuse was, uh, had no idea um, behind the veil what was really going on until that veil was removed and I could see the, um, the actors, the real actors, the true people um, behind that curtain. Uh, so, it, But it sounds like what you're talking about, this is really has to do with more human behavior and the spiritual element of it, my guess, is when now they're taking scripture. Now they're taking something that is considered holy and sacred, but now using it as 
leverage or a weapon, if you will. Is that true? It can happen that way. Uh, and let's be clear. Um, nobody says to themselves, I want to be a narcissist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. It's not like somebody <laughs> consciously says, I'm going to lack empathy and or I'm going to really be grandiose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've just, I've just never seen anybody do that. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, if the person isn't, you know, diagnosable as a narcissist, they just happen to be high on the continuum, right? Mm. Then um, you have a chance of being able to dial it back. And um, if that person has a crash, they're able to, um, with some humility and a, a spirit of repentance, sort of, you know, begin to bring that behavior into, uh, in, into alignment sure. uh, with their beliefs uh, and their desire for relationship. Um, but to be clear, this is for the most part, unconscious behavior, right? It's just, you know, it's just on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Um, now, yes, people can weaponize scripture. It's very easy to do that. Um, if, you know, a person isn't able to say, here's a, here's a hallmark thing. I always like to find a leader when they say, well, you know, this passage says X, but I might be wrong. You know, if someone who can say, you know, I think it says this, uh, but my thoughts about that may change or uh, become more expanded as I get older and live with the text. So if you can just sort of live with humility with the text, uh, you know, it's interesting. I see this more with young leaders than I see with older leaders, right? Oh, um, well, because young leaders... Oftentimes, if they're if they're experiencing some level of uh, increasing success, um, what they often have with scripture is information, but not wisdom. Mm. And you know, you can know something about a text mm. uh, and have information about it, mm. but in terms of its application, information is you know can be dangerous because you can use it as a blunt instrument. So you have to be able to uh, relate to a text both with, okay, this is a piece of information, but how do I use it with wisdom? Yeah. And, you know, you can That's tell good. the difference in a teacher if they're just like throwing out information about a text versus how do I inspire people to approach it with real wisdom? Um, you know, love looks different in different situations. And if I just have information and I spit it out, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's very helpful, you know. Mm. Um, and of course, the other big reason is that in many, many times you get a man or a woman coming out of seminary. They have all these ideas. They have their magnetic personality. And the problem is, is that their success gets ahead of their character. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. So they, they haven't developed enough character to keep up with the success they're having. Uh, they haven't had enough life experience to keep up with the success they're having. And that's when they can really derail. Mm. Now, when they do that and they derail on people, how does one handle that? Number one is a different personality. It's now abusive and it's because it's narcissistic. And it's everything that you just nailed about that person. How do staff people deal with that kind of behavior in a pastor? Well, let me not be, uh, to, you know, not to put too fine a point on it. You need to get out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's the easy answer. <laughs> I mean, well, yes, absolutely. But um, here, what, what I've, and, and this comes from just knowing a lot of worship leaders, as you do in the field, too. It may not be that easy for them to get out. They may have to still sure. support their family, so forth. And maybe they have to stay in there for that given time before they can jump ship. Uh, but so what do you say to those who are maybe going through that right now? How do they get through it? Well, I mean, oftentimes, if the a person who is uh, the kind of person I'm describing, um, they they have very they have really they have really uh, attuned antennae, and if they sense that you're not on board, 
if they sense um, that you're expendable and replaceable, they may make the decision for you pretty quick that you're you're not on the team. And uh, so I got to replace you with I got to replace you with somebody else that I can bring into the web pretty quickly. They're pretty easily threatened. Mm -hmm. OK. And um, I, I would also say that, you know, to encourage if possible, older leaders to come around that person. Um, but I mean, dude, I've seen this time and time again, you know, yeah, that kind of leader just chews people up over time. Yeah. And so I don't, I'm not going to go back on what I said. You've got to try the best you can to get out of that situation into something else. Because here's the other thing about those people. They rarely change over time. Mm. Very rarely. Yeah. Um, now, again, like I said, if if they're not, you know, exhibiting full blown pathology, right? Um, diagnosable pathology, there is a chance that they can be dialed back. Um, but it usually requires them crashing somehow, mm -hmm. you know, like something that makes them wake up. Uh, and and I've seen that, and it's lovely when it happens, right? Yeah. Because now, what did they? What did they? Uh, uh, what have they gained in that process? Wisdom, <laughs> right? They've Hopefully, gained wisdom. If they were listening. If they were listening. Yeah. Um, and I've seen that. And it's they can become amazing leaders at that point. Yes. Um, but I'm just telling you, if you have someone who's really a, a, a narcissist, mm -hmm. they may tell you, oh, my gosh, this is going to change. Like, oh, my gosh, I've been this. I have been entitled. I have been grandiose. But pretty fast, it's going to go back to what it was, Yeah, you know? Um, and they may tell you that in order to charm you yeah. again, right? Um, right? Because they're so attuned, like, what do I have to do to keep this, what we call narcissistic supply? How do I keep the, <laughs> um, the admiration coming? Well, you know, you might do it by pretending to be repentant. And so let me, am I allowed to mention a pastor? I mean, a pastor that is so well known that and there's been so much writing about him that, mm. you know, they, this person makes kind of a, a good example. Am I allowed to do that? Go for it. Mark Driscoll. Okay. So, and the reason I mention him is just because, you know, there's been a whole podcast done about him. Yep. There's been writing about him. I mean, you know. Appreciate it. The, well, I mean, that is a classic case of, of, of sort of narcissistic behavior. And he set the whole system up to protect himself. Right. And this is, again, kind of the, there's an unconscious brilliance, actually, to yeah. what they do. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying he didn't do good things. What I'm saying is that eventually he could not escape the... Uh, unconscious forces that were driving that kind of behavior mm. uh, and the success um, where in that situation, his character could not keep up with his um, success. Mm. Right? right. And the moment, the moment that character starts lagging behind the success, then you've, you've got a significant problem. He wasn't able to hear other people because he saw himself as being more intelligent, uh, more plugged into the truth than other people. Uh, he was aggressive. He was a verbally abusive. Um, and of course, he felt justified in being that way because it's like, here's a, here's a big reason. Um, look at everything God is doing through me. You know what I'm saying? And once yeah. you think that, right. then you can say, and therefore, I can do anything. I can treat people any way I like because it's in service to the advancement of the kingdom. Mm. And why would God be blessing me this way if I wasn't right. doing the right thing? <laughs> so, again, you know, churches are such complicated animals. But this, I, I work with lots of companies and most of my work is in the corporate sphere. I see this all the time, you know. Yeah. And how do um, you because now you're you're having pastors when they say, look how blessed I am, they're really saying to their staff and their church, well, look how blessed you're not. Yeah, I mean, or and how lucky it is, how lucky you are to be part of this movement. Right. 
you know. Right. Now we're talking about very large, successful churches, but this happens in smaller churches. This this happens in or smaller organizations, right? Um, and so I don't want to just say it only happens in in mega churches that are are well known. Sure. Um, it can happen in you know other you know smaller, more more modest settings, um, and uh, you know. Um, Listen, I, I do think there's something for Christians who are really struggling with some of these traits. You know, a spiritual setting is pretty sexy, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty perfect setting for this stuff to to play out in. Um, right. Let's well, look at and, authority. Yeah, and by the way, what I'm describing is also something that happens in marriages all the time. Like, I I see marriages where the woman or the guy will say, oh my gosh, in the beginning, this person was so loving. They were so caring. I couldn't wait to marry them. They were this, they were that. And then about eight weeks after we got married, they became an entirely different person. I didn't even recognize them anymore. Well, that's because that person now knows this person's in the web and it's too hard. It's going to be real hard to get out. Mm -hmm. And that's where the gaslighting starts. And then Mm -hmm. it becomes that person's fault. And then, you know, it's the same dynamic in an organization. Right. So, um, you painted a really good picture for us to understand behaviors and how us as people, we're, we're susceptible of making those same wrong choices in our own leadership. Uh, but the craftiness of it is what really gets me about the narcissistic pastor. And, uh, and thank you for sharing, you know, uh, how, what one must do, which is to get out, but to also, you know, uh, yeah, to give them, let's say you can't. Yeah. Let's say you can't get out. Let's say you got five kids in right. school and, and one of them's in a special ed program and it's going to be really hard to move them out. You know, I've, I've run into people like this. Then, you know, you have to learn some tools to minimize the amount of damage this person can do mm, good. and uh, to you. And, you know, um, there are maybe a couple of ways to do that. One, one might be to mi- minimize contact. Like, can I have as little contact with this person as possible? Right. If, if that's possible on a big staff, that might be right. And uh, just sort of focus your attention on your immediate report um, and uh, try and stay out of the uh, parking lot meetings where you're trash talking. You know what I mean? Like, it's just yeah. like, don't even go there, like minimize and try to keep your head down, do your job, love your people and and uh, have as little contact with that person uh, as possible. I've actually just been counseling a guy who's in that particular, right in that, that situation. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, if, if you can't minimize contact, I mean, sometimes with, with somebody like this, you kind of, this is going to sound terrible, but you kind of got to play along a little bit. I mean, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and right. you, 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 um, because you're you're kind of trapped in a very unfortunate prison, um, and and if you can try to come up with a game plan for getting out, now it might take a year, it might take two years, it, you you know, but just realize that that may have to be the end game, mm-hmm. um, because this this isn't probably going to change, and in those situations, can you possibly be your best? I don't think so. I mean, that's, that's just too much. And how many people have you met who stayed five years too long? Yeah. And then they come out and they're just shredded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think God wants that. No. Now I've, I've had to work through those situations myself. I've had pastors that I would, I never would want them to leave, nor would I want to leave that church. But, you know, maybe they, they were like one favorite pastor of mine retired. So then that was an easy, you know, okay, well, now it's time to move on. Other pastors that I've worked with, I had to make that jump to say, no, this is not for me. And maybe it took a little while because I had an end game in mind. Uh, But I remember the, like, very much like what you said, very good words of comfort and wisdom to me were uh, told me, keep your head down, just do your job. And like what you said, minimize the interaction, do it just enough to get your job done, but, you know, not enough to play in that person's lap or be played or be played too, but just do your job. And that's difficult, difficult for a lot of people to be in. Uh, Yeah. You got to burn, you got to burn calories to make this work. 
And who was, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard thing to be in a situation like that, but people get in that situation in court, you know, in corporate settings a lot, Mm. you know, they're, they've made a lot of money. Uh, it's hard for them to dial back their lifestyle. Um, they, um, they, you know, if they, if they leave, then they miss out on a very big package. And so they got to hang in for two years. I mean, it's not just in churches, right? It's, It's where it's wherever people congregate <laughs> that these things can happen, and right. uh, so again, you know, you're not alone uh, mm. in in these kinds of experiences. I'd also say you need to have supports in place. So, you know, uh, you need to have a therapist or a spiritual director yes. that can encourage you and give you good um, minute to minute feedback on what to do. Okay. Yes. Um, that person should not be a member of the church that you are attending. Right. Um, they should not be someone in relationship with that pastor. Uh, and, um, they, you know, if they have, if they're well-trained, they can help you to navigate that particular situation. Cause I'm talking in universals right now. I'm not talking in particulars to a, per, you know, a person's actual situation because they're all different. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you definitely need support and your spouse needs support. Mm. Uh, it's hard to be married to somebody who's in that kind of a ministry situation. Mm-hmm. Um, it can, you know, uh, bring about resentment, disillusionment. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's a real, it could be a real attack on your faith. Like, well, why does God allow this? You, you know where I'm going? Yeah. So everybody needs to have support stuff in place that will help you to survive until another opportunity comes along. So let me say something, and it's a oh man. I hope this will be heard the right way. Sure. Um, I, I was in a relationship with somebody that at at the time I can look back and say, "Wow, that was a really troubled person." And um, in the beginning, they just seemed unbelievably awesome. Now. Um, first, when I meet somebody who makes me feel incredibly good about myself, um, who goes over the top, they say things to me like, I think we could be best friends. You are amazing. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. Yeah. I tap the brakes. I ask myself, Hmm, this is a little much. I wonder what's going on here. And so I just kind of, I'm not saying I don't become friends. I just go, what's going on here? Um, I'm a just, I need to be a little bit discerning. Um, and then the, the, the other thing that I've had to do in that situation is without assigning fault or blame to me. Okay. So this is where I want people to be careful. I need to ask myself, what, what was it about me <laughs> that felt so sure. attracted to this yeah. person? Right. And how can I make what what emotional and psychological deficits did this person um, satisfy in me that I need to look at so that this doesn't happen again? Um, Because invariably, this person um, was able to intuit those things and use them manipulatively with you, right? I mean, so... You know, it might be, well, I need, I really need love and admiration. And I thought this person was going to give it to me. And I got to be careful of that in future relationships. Uh, and so there, I do think in the, in these situations, we have an opportunity to self-reflect yeah, and uh, ask ourselves some hard questions. Like what attracted me to this person? Mm-hmm. Like, and what, That's what tough. do I need to look at in my own life so that, I don't let somebody else do this to me again because they are meeting some kind of a need in me that may not be healthy. And it doesn't mean that that, that that's person's fault. He may be questioning no. himself at all. It just means that you're yeah, no, these, becoming yeah. self-aware of not getting to that situation and, and that circle of people again. Right. Because here's the thing we do know that narcissists attract a certain kind of person. Okay. And, um, those people are kind of, um, easy prey. And so we just need to look at, well, what was it about me that may have, well, which in some way inspired me to unconsciously not look at what the truth of what was going on, (laughs) you know? And, uh, so, you know, I think, um, 
I think that's always a good opportunity for people's growth. Mm. Love it. Tell, tell us about your book. Uh, how does that weave into those in ministry who may need to read it? Well, I have a brand new book called The Story of You, which is a follow up to The Road Back to You okay. that just came out, just came out about, I don't know, two months ago. Um, so there's, there are these two Enneagram books. Um, awesome. You know, the Enneagram is a really useful tool um, for helping people develop self-knowledge and self-awareness. Um, and, you know, the more self-awareness you have, the more self-knowledge you have the less likely it is that you're going to be dumped into a situation like this. Like you're just going to be aware. Like, uh, do you know what your Enneagram type is? You know, um, it's been a while since I've taken that test. I want to say it was either a seven or eight. (laughs) I don't know. Okay. So, all right, let me just go to a different one. Um, (laughs) Let's say you're, uh, let's just say you're an Enneagram two, the helper. And, you know, helpers uh, have a profound need to meet the needs of others and to uh, disavow their own needs. And when they're not very self-aware, they'll use helping other people as a strategy to win their uh, appreciation and love. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the giving is calculated. It's not altruistic. Right. Uh, And that, for obvious reasons, is a problem. Now, if you had a lot of self-awareness, you might be able to say to yourself, you know, in this relationship, I'm allowing this person to cross boundaries, uh, and I find myself always wanting to help them, and I'm always looking for their admiration and, and appreciation. I'm like so hungry for their appreciation. Well, you might stay in a relationship way too long with a pastor or somebody else if it's like, you know they become the supply of appreciation that you desperately want. So I could go through all nine types. I won't bother to do it, but you see how the Enneagram could then help you to be able to spot when you're the, the shadow side of your type is uh, in too much control of the situation. Yeah. Well, we've done a lot of talk here uh, and, and I love it. I want to know two things. First, uh, can you tell us, about you, Ian, what's your story? Yeah, well, I, I was uh, very quick. I was raised, I'll give you a spiritual biography. How's that? Okay. Uh, I was, I was, yeah, well, I was raised Roman Catholic, um, strong Irish Catholic, which is its own kind of species, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, I grew up in a, I grew up in a very abusive, alcoholic, drug addicted home um, that eventually became, I became a drug addict and an alcoholic. and entered into recovery, which has been a big part. The 12 step communities is a very big part of my own spirituality Mm -hmm. uh, as it blends with, you know, my sort of Christian background. Um, And I, I um, was a very early in, in my high school career, became involved in young life and you know, it was a it, back in a season when it was that was a very sweet kind of innocent community. I mean, it was this is I'm talking about the 1970s and 80s. This was sure. just past the Jesus People movement, and it, yeah. this is when this is when evangelicalism didn't have a political bone in its body. I right. mean, it was just you know, it was just so true. There was you know, it wasn't any sort of nationalistic, uh, yeah. Republican, conservative, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I remember those days. Yeah, I mean, it was Long so gone. different. So yeah, sad. long gone. Right. Um, yeah, it's become something I don't even recognize. No. Um, and and so, you know, um, I, in many ways, I have a great debt of gratitude to those people because they, they came into my life at a time when I, I desperately needed them. So I don't have any negative things to say about those people, you know. Um, I became a psychotherapist, uh, graduate school, and then I went to graduate school and got an MDiv. I went, did all my work for a DMIN at a Catholic university. Um, And then uh, started a church, was there as a pastor for 10 years. Uh, While at the end of that tenure, I became an Episcopal priest um, and uh, did, you know, and I still am, but on a volunteer basis. 
um, just on Sundays, you know, I'm out of church. It's the best job yeah. I've ever had in a church. They don't I, pay I me anything. I love it. Uh, and, and so, um, which means I can say no to things. That's right. Um, exactly. and, and then, um, you know, I obviously became an author, uh, and that has been my bread and butter for, you know, a decade. So yeah, I, it's been a lovely journey. Um, obviously I've had my own, um, as we're supposed to, my own, my own struggles with God and, um, and with church, you know, I, I just, I mean, I just know that churches are just so complicated, you know, they're just yeah. so complicated. And here's the thing. They're all imperfect. They will always, they will always like every other human community from your condo association <laughs> to whatever <laughs> they will because there are people involved, they will always disappoint you, right? Always. It's just impossible for them not to. You have to make space for that possibility. And as a friend of mine used to say to me, if you're disillusioned, it's because you had illusions. So, you know, uh, you know, you have to say, okay, well, maybe I was having illusions about what this yeah. place was going to be. Um, and, you know, I, um, I feel very grateful for the journey I've been on, I, I, I can honestly say that my life has been um, blessed with a, with uh, many kindnesses mm. uh, from people who cared about me and believed in me, many, some who are still in my life and others who were there for a season. And I could look back and go, oh, man, thank goodness for Bob. You know, um, he said this or they did that. And it could have been they said one thing or they I was with him for three years and they had this impact on my life. And then we moved on. I haven't seen him for 20 years, but whatever. I've had a lot of kindnesses and uh, I try to try to maintain my, my focus on, on those kindnesses. Mm. That's good. Wow. And enjoyed hearing your journey. And uh, it's amazing. You're right. How the places where God brings you. And it's also just incredible and how God's using you today just to spread that message to so many people who need it. And uh, mm. I want to get your take on something, a second question uh, that we typically ask on this show. I bring up a scripture verse, and it just so happens to be uh, James 5.13, uh, which says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. What significance does that scripture hold for you, Ian? Mm. Let me have it again. Just let me think about it. Read it again. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, uh, I think in many, many seasons of my life, I've been both of those things at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, because we, we, we all contain multiple truths, right? Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know. For those who are suffering, pray. But it doesn't say that's the only thing you should do. Um, and I, I, I would always encourage people to, to pray with others, to, to not do that in isolation. You know, um, you know uh, we, we so often uh, isolate and undervalue the power of community. I've certainly learned this in 12-step communities where, gosh, the power of having a, a, a compassionate, non-judgmental space in which to share life struggles is so so amazing mm -hmm. so healing um and you know obviously it's wonderful when you go through seasons where you can sing psalms you know but here's the thing about life man like uh i mean here's just a, a large important universal truth everything changes everything changes all the time. I will be a different person after this conversation than I was before. Everything changes. It's constantly changing. And uh, because human beings, uh, we, this, just, this is not the only thing human beings are, but human beings are processes. We're not some static thing that, you know, is not really changing. It's like, no, 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 no. You are a process that's constantly in change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, um, I really feel like it's um, like today I may be singing Psalms and three hours from now I might be suffering. And I have to remember that, guess what? 
Uh, I may be suffering, but in eight hours from now or eight weeks from now, uh, I'll be singing psalms. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah, that's good. you know, I, I just, I just, <laughs> I just keep that perspective in front of me great. all the time. You know, so that's that's so important for me. That's awesome. So, where can people find your new book, the story of you, and also your podcast? Yeah, man. I to, just to, on the story of you, I am so excited about this book because um, I think it's oftentimes hard for people to know how to change, you know? And the basic premise of this book is um, all transformation is story transformation. Um, at, at some level, if we want to experience deep, enduring change in our lives, then we have to examine and uh, most of the time rewrite the narrative in, in which we find ourselves, right? We're all in a story that we tell ourselves and others about who we are. And, and oftentimes we resign ourselves to those stories instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm the narrator. <laughs> <laughs> I don't actually have to, you know, it, as Mo Willems likes to say, you know, if you find yourself in the wrong story, leave, you know? So, <laughs> you know, this book is all about how do I, how do I leave the old story? And it does it through the lens of the Enneagram. Um, so that's the story of you, uh, an Enneagram journey to becoming your true self. Obviously, the road back to you, um, an Enneagram journey to self-discovery. Um, you mentioned some other books of mine. People can go to my website, and I'll spell it dot com, and they can learn all about courses and offerings. And, you know, there's a great Enneagram assessment on, on the site. and. Uh, the Typology Podcast, uh, which now has over 20 million downloads uh, and is um, a show that examines the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram and other stuff. I mean, you know, it's not, not a one note deal, but we got a lot happening. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm thrilled for all the things that, that are going on and at Ian Morgan Cron across all my social channels. Amazing. Man, Ian, this is uh, so good to have you on today. I, I feel like when we were back in Malibu years ago, having a cup of coffee, now we've had a second cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, man. I'm really glad. So thanks for that. Uh, so guys, uh, that was today's confession. And this is our special guest, Ian Morgan Cron. Ian, thanks again for joining us, with us today. I love it. Thanks so much. And everybody, thanks for joining us here on Confessions of a Worship Leader, where no story is too crazy, no heartbreak is too much for God to handle. And this is the podcast where your story matters and it's worth confessing. Hey, if you'd like to share your experience, uh, hit me up on Instagram or Twitter at Brandon Dempsey. That's B-R-A-N-O-N-D-E-M-P-S-E-Y. Be sure to look out for our new shows coming and special guest interviews, and you'll be notified all when these episodes drop when you subscribe to Confessions of a Worship Leader. Until next time, I'm Brandon Dempsey.